Welcome to the B2B Category Creators Podcast, hosted by Gil Alouche, founder and CEO of Metadata.io. This podcast is all about sharing the real and sometimes uncomfortable secrets of category creation in the B2B software space. On today's episode, we have Sean Riegsecker, founder and CEO of Centro, a comprehensive media automation and intelligence platform, and Rob Henshaw, co-founder and CMO of Cameo, a cloud-native digital workspace platform. Uh, this conversation is going to go only downhill from here, so I need to just make sure to officially start this, this podcast before we, we miss on any gems. Uh, hello, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Gil Alush. I'm the founder and CEO of Metadata. This is the Category Creators Podcast. Uh, I'm very excited to have uh, Rob Henshaw and Sean Riegsecker. Did I say it right? Well done. That was impressive. Yeah. Awesome. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Rob. And maybe you can tell us briefly about yourself and your company. Yeah, sounds good. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Rob Henshaw. I'm the co-founder and CMO here at Cameo. Uh, Cameo is a virtual application delivery platform. So what we do is we just make it really easy, simple, and secure for people to access all of their business critical applications, regardless of what device they happen to have in their hands. So you no longer have to worry about having a PC to run all your old legacy business software. You can just use a Chromebook or a Mac or whatever you want to use. You know, that sounds super interesting. I'm just going to jump in. And my truth is life is so incredibly crazy right now that I had no time to prepare anything for this. <clears throat> like, Three Amen. minutes ago, I'm looking at Rob's company and I'm like, this sounds amazing. And I still don't exactly know what it is, but it sounds really cool. So whoever's in charge of marketing over there is, uh, I get a pat on the back, Rob. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. These are kind words. I love that. There is no preparation needed for this podcast. So you're a great guest. Sean, tell us about yourself and your company. And uh, Rob, that was super Brief, you're like All the right. perfect, perfect guest. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Gil, I just want to let everyone know I'm drinking White Claw on a Friday afternoon. I'm here in Chicago, it's a gorgeous day. I couldn't be more excited. So, uh, so I'm Sean Riggs, I'm the founder CEO of a company called Centro, and we build enterprise level automation, uh, intelligence and activation software for the media and advertising industry. Oh, and cool. that was my condensing 19 years of my life into. <laughs> 15 seconds you did a great job you've been running this company for 19 years yeah i haven't been fired shock i mean it's a shocker to me a long time man good for you yeah almost 20 years that's and you know what I, you know it is it is i gotta tell you as you guys know right starting building something from just an idea and scratch uh is not an easy thing to do and the you have your highs you probably remember the lows but you see so many, di- you see this business from so many different areas and it's just tough. It's tough to build. It's tough to scale, tough to grow. And, and there's so many different ways to do it, but it's been a, it's been a crazy 19 years. Very cool. That's definitely awesome. I, I'm going to ask you a lot about that soon. So excited, excited to have you both. Look, this podcast is theoretically about podcast, uh, about category creation, because that's an area that I'm really trying to learn a lot about uh, because we're trying to create a category and we're trying to not make the usual mistakes of putting all the VPs in a room for seven hours and arguing about keywords and then try to convince the market that our keywords are the best. Uh, so we're trying to learn from smart people like you. Uh, and it's been very interesting. So we're going to spend some time talking about category creation in your opinions around it. Uh, but I also want to hear about just your experience starting companies. Uh, to me, that is as important. Uh, so maybe we start, maybe we can start there. Uh, Sean. You yes. start us off. 19 years, one company. Why did you start it? Um, so I, I began, so here's the thing. I, I graduated in 94. I'm going to try to make this real fast, but there is a long story. I graduated in 1994. Don't look at my age. Uh, and what happened is I, the internet was just starting. And I was like, I've got to get in this. I think this is going to transform media, communications, information, And so I worked for a newspaper and I helped put uh, the third newspaper on the web, which was called uh, Ohio.com at the time, but it was the Akron Beacon Journal. Then went up uh, to Cleveland, um, worked with the plane dealer, put them on the web in uh, 97. And then uh, 99 joined a startup streaming media company 
called Everstream, but we were really just way too early. It was like Pandora, Spotify. So great idea. We got crushed in the dot com. And then I went to work for Real Media, which was an ad serving company. And I bring it up because it was through those experiences that I just kept looking at this industry and going, it's a really complex and difficult industry. And I looked at the future and I go, it's not going to get less complex. It's going to get more complex. And I, you know, and through my experience, I'm like, guys, we're, it's just way too inefficient. I mean, this is not productive. It's way too inefficient. And I go, somebody has got to actually build a front to end comprehensive automation platform that brings buyers and sellers together, you know, and, and manages everything for them, documentation, communication, contracts, everything. And, uh, and so that was my idea. I actually brought it up to Real Media, and they were uh, going to, you know, they were merging with another company. And so in October 2001, a month after 9-11, is when I left uh, to build this vision. And if you would have told me that I would still be doing it 19 years later, uh, I would have told you you're crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, with the inter in invention of real-time bidding and programmatic and social, it's gotten so much even more complicated than it could have ever imagined. And so... We're in a great spot, but it is definitely tough right now relative to category because we don't fit in a category that exists yet. Two quick follow-ups, and then I'm going to move to, to Rob. One, you said you graduated in 94, and then not count your age. Obviously, I'm going to count it. You graduated high school or college in 94? College in 94. What the hell? You have less white hair than me, and you yeah, graduated. You know I'm going to not lie to everyone. I actually, I don't use, I use Teams, so I don't use Zoom. But Zoom has this new beta thing. I actually put a little bit of a uh, goatee, darker goatee on myself. So I don't believe it. But you, I didn't but take away my comment. wrinkles. My wrinkles are actually natural. I haven't taken the wrinkles away. You put the Not young, it. the young entrepreneur uh, mask. Hey, the, the, you know yeah. what? In 40 is the new 30 and 50 is the new 35. That's how I look at it. Amen. Well, yeah. Good, good for you. Che cheers to that. Let's just do that. Let's just. All of cheers to, to good health. I don't know about you. I'm feeling like I'm aging an extreme pace with a startup. Uh, I graduated high school in 2000. Wait, wait. Started the army in 2001, and I definitely have like a half a head of white there. Um, second question I had for you: Why you said you, you know you would never believe that you'd still be working on it? Why are you still working on it 20 years later? The big thing is this: so. Uh, bootstrapped it for the, for the quick story is bootstrapped it for the first five years. Um, nobody at, you know, at the end of the dot com was giving anybody any money to build anything. So I bootstrapped it for five years, uh, raised a couple million dollars back in 2005, 2006. That allowed me to hire really the first comprehensive uh, dev team. We started building the platform. Now, real time bidding and, and programmatic hadn't been created yet. And frankly, social hadn't really taken a very strong hold. It was really just search and, you know, ad networks and buying direct. And so, uh, we had really built this amazing platform, but the whole goal was actually to externalize the platform and sell it. But I looked at a way as an entrepreneur to say, I don't want to give up all of my company raising 50 million or 100 million, or most of my competitors have raised 250, 300 million to build it. And so, and I like companies can actually develop muscles. You can be great at raising capital, or you can be great at you know, serving clients and actually raising money. So we did that. So we've been profitable 15 out of 19 years. I've raised 50. $2 million in institutional capital. Half of that's gone for acquisitions. Another 30% uh, of it went for some secondaries to angels. And so we've really cash flowed the whole company. And then the big piece of our story is by the end of 2012, after six years of dev, because it's, it's comprehensive, it's enterprise. It wasn't something you could just build a small little MVP for and push it out to the marketplace. And at the end of 2012, we were going to launch it. And I came back from New Year's and I just sat down with the team and my guys, we're going to totally redevelop this thing from scratch. I go, because it's a great platform, but it's not the right platform. And everyone was like, you're out of your mind. Nobody liked me. Investors were not happy. Um, and we went on a five-year odyssey to rebuild everything from scratch, didn't share a piece of code. Good news is we could use all the IP that we had and the mistakes we made in the first platform. And we actually released the platform back in, 20, uh, in Q1 of 2018. And I'd submit at this point, it's absolutely the fastest growing platform in our sector. Uh, today, it is more, it's as successful as I had wished and hoped for. Uh, and, you know, future looks bright, but we got to get a category. I, I keep channeling, I'm like, I, I want someone else to actually create the same platform. So there's real competition. Real category. Love this story. So really, it's a new company or you're kind of reinventing the company. But I remember talking to many Medina. Years ago, he was also on the podcast, but years ago, he told me uh, I had a problem with the, with, the, with the dev and he told me like, 
Just redo the product. I did my product five times and he did. He recreated his product five times before he, he really went to market, which I thought was insane, but uh, it's, it's interesting. You know, one hear. thing I just, and it's for other entrepreneurs, I just want to put this out and even a couple of the companies that I've acquired and, and I asked them the question, but if you look at, um, you know, Slack and you look at Basecamp, mm-hmm. okay, both of those companies started out doing services or doing something different and they saw a problem and they're like, well, let's create this little app. And then that became their business. And I've always, and investors specifically, like, oh, we, you know, we really love the software. We don't like the services. I'm like, services can cash flow and allow you as an entrepreneur to retain your equity and not have to give up control of what you're doing. And that control becomes incredibly valuable when shit hits a fan. Absolutely. UiPath just did that. Uh, 10 years, I think, of, of professional services before they launched their actually uh, a RPA product. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. Uh, Rob, you're next. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, one of the reasons why what we're doing here at Cameo is is working so well is because it was not my idea. Um, it was <laughs> my co-founder and our original founder and our CTO, Al Dotan. Um, so Al Dotan created this uh, out of, well, it actually started, and this kind of goes back to, you know, what Sean and you guys were just talking about in terms of recreation or, you know, uh, you know, reestablishing a product a couple of times. The, the original idea that Al came up with was born out of necessity, like so many things. Um, he was just, he had a problem as a, as a coder and a, as a developer, and all of his previous companies were security companies. So Al is like a hardcore security wonk, and he needed a way to securely um, you know, create portable apps to take the things that he was working on and be able to work on them on whatever machine he had in front of him uh, without having to have, you know, everything installed locally on the device. So he created this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, app packager, portable application type of product. And then my other co-founder, um, Andrew, uh, Andrew Miller, who I've worked with for 16 plus years, a good friend of mine, he met Al and was like, oh, this is, you know, this is a cool little thing that you've developed. And he was giving it away for free. He had like 5 million downloads, like no marketing behind it. People were just using the hell out of it because it was a great product. And Andrew said, well, you know, this is a problem that a lot of people have, but it's actually the problem is a lot bigger and the solution could be a lot bigger. We could actually take this and create, you know, a virtual application delivery platform where everybody can access all their applications. None of those applications have to be you know, installed locally on your device. You know, if you're an IT person, you can just give people access to all the things that they need. And you don't have to worry about managing those applications locally. Um, so that was the, the genesis of it. And back in 2017, um, AL started working on the commercial version, the enterprise version that we have today. Um, I joined in 2018 as the third co-founder. And that's when we started, you know, kind of taking this to market and, and you know, helping to, you know, highlight the fact that, look, there's, there's all these, you know, today as an IT person, you know, you've got so many, you know, so much on your plate, so many different problems, applications and keeping people productive should not be something that you're dealing with. And we also had an idea three years ago that the world is moving increasingly to a, you know, a remote structure. People need to be able to work, you know, while they're on the road, they need, you know, we weren't even thinking about pandemic times, obviously, but just the ability for people to be a little bit more flexible to whether that's working from home or just being road warriors or traveling a lot, they need to have the same access to all the stuff that they have at the office, all the things that they need to be productive. Uh, And, you know, how do you do that? How do you make sure that they can be secure no matter what network they're on, what device they have, all those types of things. Um, so, you know, we, we decided to make this, this big push for virtual applications being different than virtual desktops, which was what everybody thinks of when, you know, or used to think of when you had to enable people who were out of the office, you said, oh, well, let's just give them a, you know, virtual desktop and send them on their way. And anybody who's actually ever used a virtual desktop knows that that's not the way that you actually want to, <laughs> to, to run your business. And we talked about this. Yeah. 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 So we, we realized that, look, you know, there's, there's a small fraction of the, the world who actually needs to, you know, work on a full virtual desktop, like that needs a full, you know, virtual desktop environment. Most people just need access to 10 to 12 apps to do their job. Um, so this is what we did was we focus on virtual application delivery. Very cool. Um, so you, you kind of, re- both of you reinvented, start with something, saw the potential, reinvented. Uh, wait, pause. Let's have a cheer. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. gentlemen. Happy Friday. Do you find yourself in a category creation or a category differentiation battle where you have to 
constantly explain we're nothing like that. We're something completely different. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I think in, we talk a lot about, you know, category creation and everybody talks about, you know, every marketer talks about category creation. It's the sexy thing to talk about. I think a vast majority of us, if we're honest with ourselves, are not doing category creation. We are doing category recreation or, you know, you know category disruption. Um, so for us, you know, we walked into a world where there was an existing, you know, I think of it this way, there, there was, you know, we, came, we stumbled across this town and the town was well established. There's a bunch of people who live there. Um, but then as you look around, you realize that that town still has, you know, dirt roads and there's no lamp, you know, lamp posts, and it's a you know, very antiquated little town and it hasn't, you know, grown and, and adapted to the needs of its inhabitants. And we realized, yeah, that town could be built a lot better. Uh, it could serve its, its people a lot better. Um, and so it's not, you know, you don't just go in and, and raise the town and just, you know, destroy everything and, and start over and create a new category. It's, it's kind of disrupting the, what people in that town are used to and giving them something that is going to serve their needs better, even if they don't know it yet. Um, and so for us, it was not so much of, hey, stop talking about virtual desktops, the world, you know, you have to use the word virtual application delivery. It's that, that, that makes no sense because virtual desktops are still a thing that you can, that you can buy and there's still, still a category that exists. We don't have to destroy something to prove that we are valuable. What we can do is say, hey, look, for the people where that makes sense, if you want to live in that antiquated town, cool, like do your thing. If that works for you, awesome. If you're not happy with that, if it doesn't meet your needs, if you are looking for something different that's a little bit more flexible and is going to work, you know, work better for you, come over here to, to virtual application delivery land. So it's, it, you know, so often that is just kind of a, you know, a, um, a spinoff of a category as opposed to saying, look, we need to, you know, disprove something else or create something net new. It's really just a shifting of expectations and, and adapting the expectations of the market and the category naming to what people actually need in the new world that we live in. That's interesting. That's, very, that's like the kindest explanation I got about depositioning because most companies that I that I know or, or CEOs that I've interviewed put depositioning as like the number one thing you have to do. Like there is the old world, new world. Fuck the old world. It's the worst thing in the world. You are making mistakes even contemplating on it. You should definitely go with us. And so that town, burn it. You know, like you should, you should stop living there immediately. Come to our big capital metropolitan city. It has everything you want. And you're saying not at all. Like, do you find that to be? Yeah, like, you know, you don't need to. You don't need to convince the world that you know somebody is ugly so that they think that you're pretty. You know, you can that that, that person can still exist. You know, like it, it does, you don't have to destroy something in order. What about the foresters and the gardeners of the world? You know, putting all those waves and the uh, and magic coordinates, and then you you find that that uh, you know lifeless town in the top right hand corner and your metropolitan city at you know maybe not even mentioned well that's always going to happen right whenever you're creating a category whenever you're starting to do something new you are always going to find you're always going to start at a position where you are not where you know ranked where you want to be because you're still viewed like when you're starting out right we're two and a half you know years into this or almost three years into this journey and we're just now getting the place where virtual application delivery is a conversation it's something that people are talking about Two years ago, we were sitting there frustrated as hell because everyone was talking about virtual desktops. Everybody's talking about virtual desktops. Everybody's talking about DAS and VDI and all these different things that were built. You know, you know, VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure, was built before the cloud even existed. You know, so it's like you know they're they're still talking about old ideas and and then trying to put us within the frame of those old ideas. So you're always going to start in that frustrated experience, you know, place. If you're if you're looking to go down the, the path of category creation and you feel and you think that you're not going to be pissed off for a little while or you feel like you're not going to be like frustrated by where you are in the in the in the quadrant or in the wave, yet yeah, like you got something else coming to you. Like it's going to be a frustrating experience, but that's what create category creation is all about is that you have to fight your way to you know out out of that category into your other thing into the transition that you're going to make so on that and gil and robin i know gil you've had this podcast uh who and and how do you go about actually finally getting theoretically an analyst to create a category 
And I've got a funny story about that, but I'm interested to see what you've learned uh, so far. I haven't done it myself, so I, I will let Rob say, but I, you know, I, later on, maybe I can share one thing that Diana from... Um, um, Invoca? Yes, Invoca, thank you. Uh, tell, tell us, not about Invoca particularly, but about Yammer and about uh, Hootsuite, where she used the same tactic. But maybe you can start, Rob. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's interesting because there's, there's like these two schools of thought, of, right, of, of who creates categories, right? Some people are like, oh, no, it's the analyst. Like, you can't create a category until the analyst, you know, backs it. And then there's the other people who are like, oh, no, it's the, the, the marketers who are pulling the strings in the background. The reality is, is that it is neither one of those things. It is like nothing, nothing happens. None of this happens without customers, right? So as a marketer, I can say until my face is blue that this is the category. This is the category. I could even convince you know, a couple analysts to start, you know, looking into it. But until I, until they are seeing demand, until they are seeing customers need something else, right? Then, then it doesn't, not, like nothing will happen. So customer adoption, customer traction, getting the customers to, to get in front of those analysts and say, look, yeah, I know you keep telling me that I need to look at virtual or virtual, you know, desktops, but I've looked at those and it doesn't meet my need. I need an alternative. What is the alternative? You know, until the, until the analysts start hearing that message time and time again from actual customers who are looking for something else, then there's no reason for that analyst to think about creating another category or, or even validating another category. And that's exactly what the analyst said, actually. What did exactly what she said, and she actually built a tactic around it. Uh, yeah, it used to be my boss. So, she yeah. used to be your boss. Okay, so, yeah. so you may have experienced that. She, she mentioned how she, the, at first at Yammer they were getting butched basically by analysts, being hated, uh, you know, oh, yeah. be, because you know there there was the user driven adoption versus the enterprise, you know, choosing to do something, oh, yeah. and uh, she created a program out of it. Uh, she she had a few customers at first call the analyst and like not be sure, like oh, right, we really want this Yammer thing, but you're telling us it's dangerous and not secure. Like should we do it or not? And then she got some traction out of those weird conversation. And she said, shit, this, uh, this is going to be great. And she organized a big group of customers to call and bombard the analyst with phone calls and with their opinions about it. And then she, she did it again at, uh, at Hootsuite using Hootsuite's uh, platform. Uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the tactics that, that, we're, that we're trying to preserve here, the category creators, because it seems to be a common, a common pattern. Um, so that's very interesting that you mentioned. Well, that. I think it's difficult from an innovation perspective. And a couple of stories on our end is this, which is, uh, and, and I, I would say, look, I think that when you look at investing in companies, innovative companies, you begin with, and how many times have investors in PE firms, VC firms say hearing this, but who's your competition? Well, we don't have any competition. What they don't recognize, that's actually the worst almost thing to be. Because what that means is that marketing and categorization leadership is a, is a rule of perception. It's, 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 it's a game of perception. And so if there isn't an actual category or a place where a brain can slot something in, then therefore people don't actually recognize that there's a need that's actually understood across an entire organization. And as we know, you know, the super majority of the world is, is risk averse. I don't want to change. I don't want to do something different. You know, I don't want to take a risk. I mean, all of those things come together. Yeah. So in a weird way, if you're the first, okay. And by the way, has, have you, either of you guys actually read the book, 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing by Al Rees and Jack Trout? Uh, yeah. they were, they I have 94. not. It is, I recommend it to every single person. because What's I think the name of the book balanced. again? Maybe. It's called the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. And the first two rules are this. And the first rule is that it's better to be first than to be better. Now, and they just talk about that it's better to get there. But then the second rule is that if you can't be first in a category, create your own category. Okay. And then there's, there's a lot more to it, but this, and cause they really speak all about category creation. It's kind of what the whole book is based upon and it's placing it's the goal is to get the position in a customer's mind relative to the product, the service or the need or something along those lines. So it's really cool. And so in a weird way, if we're going to create something that actually doesn't exist, um, then you get into this place where you're like, okay, I want competition. The more people, right, who can talk about what Rob's doing, the better Rob's companies will be, especially because Rob also happened to be first. But I, I go from there. And, and so we, we, if you took uh, for our software, right, if you took our platform, 
if you took an ERP system that was purposely built for the media and advertising industry, and you took a DSP, and you took a BI system, and you took a communication and messaging platform like a Slack, and if you seamlessly built them uh, in a sophisticated backend architecture for an industry, that's what Basis is, which is our software. Now, here's the problem. No one else has that today. So if you go to G2, okay, Godard, you know, mm -hmm. good friend. But if you go to G2, we are number one in the DSP category, which is awesome. But at the same time, and I'll give you, a, this is the truth, from one of the two largest research firms uh, out there. <clears throat> two years ago, they, they were going to do away with a certain wave report. And they came out and they said, uh, we're going to do a what they call the media management system report on systems that actually string together more things. Okay, they do more than just one specific point solution. <clears throat> and they sent out a whole RFI to the industry and it came back. And then the next thing you know, we get an RFI for, well, we're going to do this thing called an omnichannel video, a video, an omnichannel video report. And I go, what happened to the media management system report? And the individual leading it said to me, I can't just do a, I can't put out a quadrant with one company in it. And I'm like, yeah, you can. I'm like, because it's true, right? So in this weird way, I'm as much poking the bears. You know, where's SAP? Where's Oracle? Where's Salesforce? Where's Google? You know, where's, you know, these other folks? Why aren't they getting into this space? Because every single industry will be absolutely transformed and turned upside down through automation and autonomous software. And if that's true, why aren't we focusing on that why do we keep focusing on, in our industry, programmatic advertising, which candidly is the opposite of automation. Programmatic is actually increased cost. It's actually in, it's decreased productivity. It's decreased efficiency. It's <clears throat> increased complexity. You don't save money. It's just, it's the opposite benefit of what an automation platform does. So don't confuse, pro I'm like, I give a presentation, I'm like programmatic is not automation. Don't confuse the two. Yeah. They're totally opposite things. Did you win? Did, what, was the, what was the end of that conversation with the analysts, one of the top two? Did well, you, I mean, did we you... showed up in the omni-channel video, but we're not in the top right uh, because like, it's just weird. Like it's, I mean, yeah, we do all those things, but it's like you're missing, you're missing the big picture. But because there's no competition right now that has everything we do, there is, I, I can't, it sucks because I could be maybe third, fourth, fifth or a challenger. In a against, but I'm competing against point solution quadrants versus comprehensive enterprise level, you mm -hmm. know, uh, quadrants. Yeah, when you don't define your category, when someone else defines the RFI uh, attributes, then and it's, it's a trouble. Sean, from your perspective, would you, if you had a choice to pay Godard 100K or Gartner 100K to help you define your category or even attract? more enterprise customers, which one would you go with? Well, I would, I would like to say I'd pay Gart, uh, Godard a hundred thousand, but I, that wouldn't, I'd be lying. Um, even though I do, you know, and Godard and I were in YPO together. So, uh, I've had a long relationship with him. Um, I mean, I think I, you know, the, the sad point, uh, my thing is you almost have to pay Gartner. Although this whole peer Gartner quadrant thing that they've done to compete with G2, I think is fascinating that they're going to try to, create a similar product, but you have to go with what are the, what does your target market look at and who do they trust? Um, and you know, what I have always disliked is, and I'll use the demand side platform, the DSP category, cause that's part of our business, which is there's no, by the way, demand side platforms are it's generic technology. Okay. There's no difference. And what I mean by that is, yeah, it's hard to build and it's very difficult. And yeah, you know, there's a big mode around it. And if you haven't done it, you probably, not going to get it done. However, um, the difference between the people who are demand side platforms, it's on the margins. The last Forrester wave that came out said we could almost find no distinguishable differences between any of the DSPs, which is why they stopped doing it. Okay. I had a point to that conversation, but I don't remember what it was. Good timing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. I'll make sure to tell Goro to, uh, to send you a quote. Oh, but I just, yeah, thousand. my thing is, look, it's, you know, it's right now the marketers or your target customers are looking at that. Um, it's completely so right. I, part of it. I understand. You're saying my target customers are looking at the gardeners, the foresters. So, you know, I got to pay them. Um, 
Yeah. We almost chose our target market to start with, the beachhead, to be the ones who are going to G2 because it's so much easier to, to be ranked. If you think, you know, if, if you are ranked highly, highly by customers and uh, it's just easier. I, I find G2 to, to be almost like a Robin Hood for, for SaaS. We're almost, My thing uh, is, is that you, they just changed the goalposts. That was the point. How it's so? like since like there's it, no the, actual the, feature the differences. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this was actually the time this was Forrester for years. It's like, Forrester. and literally their goalpost that, that changed was QPS, which is, you know, queries per second. That was it. I mean, that literally was, okay, well, you got to have this much. Well, and we kept going, guys, like, look at feature to feature and what we have. But they, you just can't, every year, it's like, well, we can't find out, so we'll just change the goalposts. And, you know, Google's going to obviously be number one. But that's the thing, you know, like you're talking to an analyst with an opinion and ego and maybe all kinds of like all kinds of different goals that they're optimizing towards. And I'm like, shit, I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no idea how to play this game. And well, it's thing, easier but, to play it with the customers. Like customers but, say, yeah. I'm not giving a shit about QPS. This is what we, what they care about. And so they'll rank you differently based on what <laughs> actual customers But Gil, I specifically said this and Rob, you'll understand. I go, you do realize that that means nothing. I could literally add 400 more servers and process more QPS. I don't need it, but I could do it. It's just a cost. I mean, it's not a way to look at anything. It's not right. a differentiating It's a vanity factor. metric, yeah. It's just, yeah, that's, that's the point. It's like, it, it has nothing to do with the users. Yeah. Rob, what, what do you feel about, about this? The whole uh, analyst versus uh, more democratized, new, new version of, uh, of categories? I don't know. I, I don't think that, um, I mean, especially somebody who, who has, you know, been focused on, you know, early stage startups where I can't pay Gartner a hundred thousand dollars, right? It's just not a, it's not an option. Even if I wanted to do that, it's simply not an option. Uh, and it's not, I, I truly do not believe that it's necessary. And here's the reason is that, uh, you know, I could, I could pay a Gardner hundred thousand dollars or, and I don't want to pick on Gardner. It could be any of them. Um, you know, I could pay any analyst from hundred thousand dollars and say, you know, define this category, give me what I want, you know, everything like that. You're still probably not going to end up with the end result that you wanted because the, the analysts are going to want to put their own flavor on it. So that, it, so that it doesn't feel like it's completely paid for. They're going to do all these different things and you're going to waste a whole bunch of money and not end up getting the exact thing that you want. So, and the reality is, is that, you know, at the end of the day, if you, if we're focused on paying a, you know, hundred thousand dollars to Gartner, I'd rather give a hundred dollars to a thousand customers to go out and say, none of your categories work. you like, I don't like any of these categories. Give me something else. Right. Like that would be a better use of my money is to, is to rally my customers, rally the people whose, whose needs we are actually meeting and get them to tell their story, you know, to, to get them to, to be passionate and get out there and then help spread the word about this category. That's a much better use of funds, you know? But, and so you know, yeah. at the end of the day, I don't, I do not take any stock in the fact that you have to go out and pay huge dollar amounts to an analyst firm. I think that even you, you, the, the reality is that you have to be somewhat comfortable with the fact that uh, if you go this route of saying I'm not going to pay for you know any of these analyst firms to create a category for me, you have to to realize that that's that means you're going to have a couple of years of going it alone and having to prove and having to you know gut it out. But if you can if you're if you're truly focused on you know meeting your customers' needs and and doing you know no matter what industry you're in, if you're focused on doing what the customer actually needs and you and you're you're getting traction because of that then you are going to be able to find users that are passionate enough who will help you, who will go out there and say, I didn't know, like I was told for 10 years that this was my only option. These guys came and all of a sudden opened my eyes to this entirely different way. And they met the need that I didn't, you know, that I didn't know there was even a solution for. You're going to find those passionate users if you focus on the customer, if you just do what the customer needs. And then eventually you'll get to a place where the analyst can't ignore and can't, you know, you know, you can't say, okay, there's only one way to do this. We need to look at, you know, either an entirely new category or a, at least a subset of a category or something, some type of a spinoff that, you know, eventually you'll get to a place where the, the analyst can't ignore it. So I think two things on this, and I think we got to, and I want to actually be fair to the analyst firms. Okay. First of all, and by the way, if I could pay a hundred thousand dollars 
to get a category created that I'm the only winner. I will do that. So if you guys are aware that that is true, I would have a good. I want to be fair in the sense that I don't look at the analyst firms as, as pay to play. I don't think because I spend money with them, I'm necessarily going to get higher ratings. I mean, you know, I mean, that I just, I fundamentally don't believe that. And I think there is a level of integrity that they have. Now, yeah. if your people are paying a lot of money, but I think here's the big difference. We have to understand that the people who are buying the research, okay, tend to be Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 customers. Absolutely. Yeah. And most startups are not serving the okay. Fortune 500 customers and Fortune 1000 right. companies. So because yeah. of that, uh, and there, by the way, that's where I think G2 comes in in a really amazing, they served a need, they found a white, white space in there. Um, because it also goes to who they interview. Because a lot of the times their quadrants are based upon customer surveys that they send out. Now, the think about the surveys they send out, they're sending them out most of the time to people who are also buying their research and they're weighting them heavily mm -hmm. to that. So right. you just got to be smart about at what stage in your life cycle do you actually choose uh, to create that level of a relationship. Could not agree more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in, in the early days, you are focused on serving the customer and those a lot of times the customer is not the person who is buying that research to begin with. So if you're focused in your very early days of a startup on, you know, dumping a bunch of money into, you know, category creation with an analyst, like those, a lot of, a lot of your target customers are probably not ever going to download that report. Could not agree right. more. John. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, completely now there is the value, you know, depending upon who you're going to, it's really impressive if you can get a, but if you go to every single quadrant, Put out by the historically uh, well-known analyst firms, they tend to favor the businesses who serve Fortune 500 companies. Regardless of how good software is, that's who gets the top right. Scale, market share. Well, they may have, you know, I may have, which yeah. isn't, you know, but a, a startup company actually may have 5,000 small businesses where the leader in the category actually may only be serving 200, but they're, you know, 30 times the size. Okay. Right. And there's a little bit of weighting that goes to market share versus quality and versus features. So you're, you're almost differentiating. Uh, it's fascinating because I, I almost heard both of you say it first, the, the same thing, and then go a little bit uh, sideways. Uh, G2 does serve the mid market and startups. Totally true. Yep. Less of the enterprises. It's my personal opinion that it's going to change. And the enterprises are going to start looking at G2 and Trust Radius as well because the centralized versus uh, crowdsourced force approach is different. But that's just uh, something to say about G2, not nothing else. But you both agree on the fact that if you if you if your ideal customer profile is the enterprise, then Gartner or Forrester or IDC, though this is the way to go because that's where the buyers go. Uh, you may not be able to buy it for hundred thousand dollars, but they're going to look at that and they're going to look at if you serve enterprises, even if you don't have the best price, the best product, uh, that's who the Gartner's serves in terms of the research. So you should focus right. on that. If it's more mid market to startups, you don't have to worry about it. You can go to the G2 and trust. Mm -hmm. radius. Yeah. But the, you know, the, the beauty of, so if you read a Gartner or a forest report now, they've done depth, they've done in-depth interviews, they've actually done the surveys and there's some level of that that are sprinkled in their, their, their feedback. But you want raw truth, right? Go to go to G two, or go to use. I mean, the users. It's it's a. I mean, it's amazing to see what people say about our product. I mean, it's just yeah. you know, and nobody pays them. We you know, nothing's happening. It's just people would choose to put up a video of our product, which is always shocking to me that someone would do that. Um, and so, and it's the same thing with even companies and culture. It's like Glassdoor. Like, can it look? You read the glass door, you read all of them, you know, if you, you read the first two pages and you got a pretty damn good idea of what's going on inside that company. Good. Totally. And, you know, and you, you know, you put your waiting, you know, the, you know, there's always going to be people bitching and moaning, but at the same time, there's enough nuggets, gold nuggets in there that you'll learn. And yeah. I think it's the same thing with user reviews of software. Totally agree. That, that's great. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion. I could, I could continue this forever. Uh, I want to switch gears. Let's do another round of, uh, of cheers. Cheers. I'm finishing my first drink now. Let's take 15 seconds for you to go and grab another drink. I hope my mother doesn't watch this. She's not a big fan of my alcohol consumption. <laughs> Just alcohol. Uh, it could be a lot worse. Uh, 
let's change gears completely. <laughs> tell me about, uh, Rob, you started us off. Uh, tell me about a personal, either a personal truth that you feel is very unknown, you know, like a, an absolute truth that you, that you, that is not on Saster or TechCrunch interviews, or alternatively on a well-known misconception bullshit that is, you know, heavily marketed in the stories about founders and startups, but you know, it's, it's completely trash. It's not the reality at all. That's a good one. Um, I'll go with kind of a blend of the two. I think a personal truth, uh, you know, and it kind of goes into uh, debunking, you know, popular belief, which is that I, th I think for me, it's the, the fact that as a CMO, we, one of the things that we have to be more than anything is, uh, is humble. Uh, if you, if you believe that I mean, don't get me wrong, to be a CMO at a startup and to convince people and get people excited, you have to be bold. You can be bold and still be humble. Um, but there's an idea that there's this like misconception that CMOs have to be good at everything, right? Like there's they're, they're, like, the, if you look at the universe that, that, you know, that we have to control of you know, everything from content strategy to PR and comms to demand gen, you know, and, you know, everything, you know, that all the different, you know, things that we have to manage, the idea that a CMO is a master of all those things is just a fucking myth. Like none of us are, you know, and if, and, and you have to be, you have to have the humility as a CMO, I think at least, you know, to, to potentially be a good CMO, you have to be, you have to have the humility to say where your gaps are. And, and I think that's the only thing that is actually going to get you to the point where you can hire the right people to be around you to where you can fill those gaps, where you can find the rock stars and elevate those rock stars and say, you know what, I'm not the content guy. That's the content guy. Like, you know, like you have to be able to, to let go of those things. Uh, but there's this, I think, especially in the startup culture, there's this idea that as a CMO, you have to be this like, you know, master of all things and it's just not realistic you can't be so focus on your master trade your your core competency hire for the rest and be be humble about your true skills what uh what about you sean um 19 20 <clears throat> years of, of a company yeah here's top. here's something that i don't know if i've ever publicized it and it has just to do a little bit with the mindset but and i, I kid you not this happened last evening it probably happens almost every evening uh, whether, you know, I've studied toxic shame, Renee, uh, Brene Brown does a lot of work on it. And I think that I suffer from that, but whatever, you know, I suffer from psychologically. I don't know what that means. <clears throat> toxic shame, by the way, you have to elaborate. Toxic shame, just toxic shame uh, has, you know, it's too long to get into. And we'd, you'd ask me to take a drink, but people can just research, just Google toxic shame. Toxic shame. Okay. Uh, <laughs> about 20%, I'll, I'll, they say the population has it, but it, the people that suffer from toxic shame uh, have an intrinsic belief that they are not worthy of the love or praise or, or success or things like that. And so they're mm. con consistently beating themselves up, but <clears throat> you know, it's this internal dialogue and, my internal dialogue comes out of my mouth <clears throat> uh, at times. And it's usually in the evening as, you know, I think when we sleep, we process what happened to our life. But at the, in my evening, I'm just going around and literally I'm, I'm thinking in my head and, and all right, I'm going to just say what I like. I'm like, I'm like, fuck myself. I'm like, oh, fuck me. Like, oh, like all I'm doing is just going through my day and I am criticizing Everything I said, every, I mean, I'll be criticizing myself in two hours going, oh, fuck me. Why did I say that? I'd probably say that about saying fuck me, but <clears throat> um, just a little bit meta. How do you like that? You know, <laughs> I like it's it. a little meta. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and so I think that, I mean, that's just something that it's just, but, you know, I also have loved this story. And I don't know if you guys ever saw it, but um, there was a CEO and he, he did this analogy. He's like, entrepreneurship is like a person riding a lion. He said, where everyone looks at, and they used the, the, the male pronoun, but like everybody, you know, he's like, everybody looks at this guy in the lion and go, wow, look at that guy in the lion. He's so brave. That's amazing. And the guy in the lion is sitting there going, how the hell did I get on a lion? And what do I got to do to not get eaten by this damn thing? <laughs> and I don't think entrepreneurship could be summed up better than that where everyone looks at you and go, wow, that just must be so cool. And you're sitting every day 
with massive amounts of fear and stress. I mean, just it's yeah, I mean, I think that's just the truth that you ask Gil, what I think the truth is. I love that. That is an absolute truth. No question. Uh, managing the psyche for an entrepreneur is tough. I love that analogy with the lion. That's uh, it, it, it's a very interesting, yeah, very interesting I love analogy. That idea. <laughs> um, cool. I, I would love to hear a story. Uh, Sean, given what you, you just that that truth you just landed on us, and thank you for that. Uh, I do think it's it's great to share those with with people because. I think everyone is experiencing those things anyway. Um, maybe a, a hashtag fail moment that you beat yourself up and said, ah, how did that happen? Um, and you can go back, you know, it's 19, 19 years for that company. So you have, you know, you can, you can pull the one that you, that you like or hate the most, the hashtag fail moment that you hate the most. I would say, you know, the biggest mistakes, and I think this was, I would say this is almost a universal truth. <laughs> And it starts with this, a hundred percent of the success of your company is dependent upon the quality of the people that you hire, period. And there is no business that that is not a true statement about. Yeah. So I always believe that our biggest mistakes are people-based. You know, one of my board members has a great line. <clears throat> and, you know, if there's ever a quote unquote problem, he's like, uh, he's like, uh, who's the name of the no he, he's like every problem has two feet who's the problem <clears throat> okay and he's right every problem is a person problem you have and so my hashtag fails would just be i've just made some bone ass bonehead hires that probably at a instinctual or guttural level i was like i don't think this is going to work or i don't know if this is the right person and then you know you got to deal with it, and there's been just crazy stories of stuff I've had to take care of, clean up, and turn over at you know leadership ranks, and it's just it's really I mean the people side is the hardest thing anyone will ever do uh, and get right I believe. Thank you, Sean. Uh, you were not specific. I didn't share a particular example. I couldn't but because I honestly okay. well, I don't. We'll I've never made a cool. mistake, and that's my. <laughs> Other than that's your weakness, uh, no, Rob, I, you, remember, you I made a mistake 10 years ago and it was this one day. I remember that I, I thought I was wrong, but I was actually really right. You were right. At the and end. that's no, the only fine. mistake. I, it I was okay. It making. was okay. It was okay. Nothing happened actually. Uh, I, maybe you could take I, I some more time. Shame is really an issue for you, Sean. I think you're doing great, man. <laughs> <laughs> not toxic. It's not shameful. It's, it's all good. Uh, Rob, what about you? Do you have a, a moment that you think uh, that you go keep going back to is like shit. That was that was a big failure. Uh, I don't think me. anybody who's been you know doing any sort of startups for any amount of time doesn't have a dozen of those. But uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so back at uh, there's a company called Sugar Sink. Uh, this was back in 2011, 2012. Uh, so we were the the kind of distant third in the file sync and sharing like race. So it was Dropbox, Box, and then Sugar Sync. Um, and we were, you know, late to the party. Um, you know, by the time we launched, Dropbox already had 10 million users. Um, but, you know, we went from zero to 27 million users in two years, in the time that Dropbox went from 10 to 100. So, you know, we, we had very, very rapid growth. Um, the thing that just to this day, just, ooh, like it kills me is that we, there was this moment in that, in that, that space, right. Where we, you know, we were, we were kind of blowing up. We were growing quickly. We won over, a, you know, our, our strategy at the time was kind of a Pepsi challenge. It was like, Hey, you know, try Dropbox next to sugar sink. Tell us which one you like better. Um, and we won over a hundred head to head reviews, like Walt Mossberg, everybody. Um, but then there became a, a period in that, you know, where it was just, there was very consumer focused, those apps, it was syncing all of your, you know, photos and your files and everything on your phone to your computer, everything like that. Um, but then it started shifting to, Hey, look, there's a massive need for this in the enterprise as well. And as we all know, box very, very early on was like, peace out consumers, we're going business. And, you know, like, and that was a, obviously a great move for them. Uh, Dropbox kind of, you know, rode, they, they threaded the needle pretty perfectly where they kind of did both. And at SugarSync, we were just, we were so hung up on the, the speed that we were growing focused on the consumers that we could not get out of our own way. 
and realized that there was a bigger opportunity. Um, so I think just sometimes as an entrepreneur, recognizing that momentary success does not always guarantee long-term success. And like, that can be a big blind spot for, for a lot of us. And that was definitely a blind spot for us. That's a big, well, what, that's a big insight. What would you do? Like, how, how would you recognize that at the time and, and do things differently? It, it's tough, you know, um, in hindsight, you know, you look at uh, now in hindsight, it's obviously, it's like, well, the, clearly the decision was, you know, you know, focus on the enterprise customers. That's where the money was. Um, I think for us uh, to, to I, I think more than anything, it was an arrogance issue for us is that we, we, ha- we were winning all the head-to-head reviews. We were growing really rapidly. We had a freemium model. We were converting, you know, people to pay to the pretty decent rate, um, you know, at a higher rate than Dropbox was at the time. So we had so many different, you know, signals that were telling us that we were doing the right thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard. If I look at that situation, like given the same information, if I was put back in the same situation, would I have made a different, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's just, um, sometimes it's, it's hard to take a step back and think about, okay, we created one thing and the market is now shifting. And the thing that we've built, it doesn't, you know, the, it's still great, but it could be adapted for this bigger audience for this bigger thing. Should we, should we do that? And I think sometimes, you know, we, we get a little bit too in the weeds and focused on our day to day. And we just say like, no, I'm not going to think about that other thing. Cause I've already got too many things on my plate based on what I am currently focused on. And sometimes, you know, we all as entrepreneurs need to take a step back. We need to step out of our circles out of our little echo chambers of people who, you know, are developing the same things and like get some external feedback and just, you know, chat with people about, Hey, you know, what are you thinking? Like, you know, are you trying to use this stuff at work? Would it be helpful if you had sugar sink at work? Would that be cool? Like, I, you know, that, that's the type of thing that I feel like as entrepreneurs, we all need to, to step away from time to time and seek external feedback. Very fair. So like maybe question the fundamentals, be ready to, to pivot or re- reinvent the business. Yeah. Um, Cool. Gents, I realized it's 3.05. I have been having a great time because uh, this is the second time only in like dozen podcasts that I'm going over. Uh, I will ask you to finish your drink. I'm go- I'm, I know I'm going to. So no, I'm cheers. not getting. Uh, if White Claw is listening, can I get a sponsor? I mean, can I get sponsored? I, <laughs> Absolutely. I, uh, Kameo not- can help you with that. Uh, yeah. on, the next, on the next podcast, Sean's going to have like a jersey. Mm-hmm. Uh, white claw jersey yeah i'm buying i'm gonna send you a basis t-shirt and you better be rocking that thing you want v-neck or a uh, crew neck just let me know uh, the regular <laughs> crew neck it's gonna i'm gonna be walking down the street of santiago with that uh, i love that i love that you're in santiago man gil i gotta say man like this podcast you know first of all kudos to you for um just you know wanting to learn more and and chatting with people it's fun for us like i love hearing stories from you know folks like sean in different industries it's so it's beneficial to all of us even if you've been doing it for 20 years it's so fun to hear the different stories for thanks so thanks for putting this together man thank you i really appreciate that i just find it cathartic to hear that you know i'm not the only person who's you know gone through mistakes or has (laughs) a, a hard road but i really do believe that there is something just incredibly valuable about bringing people together and actually and really my thing is don't bullshit right you know drop the ego yeah. And, you know, let's roll up our sleeves, show our battle wounds, show our scars, because it's only through, you know, learning from others and what the hard shit, that's why I read biographies all the time. But it's like, you realize that every person has gone through hell yeah. to build something that has changed industries and changed the world. And that's just what you sign up for. And uh, you just got to stick to it and hope. And I say, look, we probably are successful because we've said no more times than we've said yes. And I think you got to really define what you're going to be great at. And from there, just keep building. I love that. Thank you very much for your candor. I did like lots of notes. I am learning a lot, a shit on from this. You wouldn't believe. Um, at some point, I'm going to publish it, but only after I start to dominate my category. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll, we'll, definitely- <laughs> well, hey, well, Gil, I'm <laughs> super impressed, man, with you guys and uh, what you're doing. And I yeah, I just, yeah. I, don't, I still don't know what Rob does after the hour we spent together, but I'm going to go figure it out and learn because it sounds <laughs> pretty freaking amazing. I spent half an hour with him and I got it. It's amazing. It really is amazing. Uh, we were talking about, you know, my wife is an expectation. We were talking about how 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 providers 
do the crazy VPN from home and how it never ever fucking works and how no. he solved it. And that's just one use case. So hey, I really you, do. Uh, I'm not kidding. I literally saw it. I'm like, this sounds perfect. It's been like, this is such a need. By the way, look, I just want to say that I think there's white space all over oh, right yeah. now. And I think specifically it's around automation, B2B. I mean, the technology that these, that most people have is terrible. It's yeah. horrible. It's painful to actually use that. I mean, there is just so much huge, massive opportunity right now. But anyways, awesome. Love you guys. That was great. Thank you. It was really nice meeting both of you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Uh, thanks for participating. Cheers, really guys. Cheers, Safety guys. and health. Take care. Take care. Bye, guys. Thanks again for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed today's discussion and will tune in again. Find all of the B2B Category Creators episodes at metadata.io. And if you have any feedback, topics, or would like to be a guest on the show, please reach out. 